plastic ingestion by fish in this region. I will be, first I'll give you a couple of words of um, just general overview, then the results of my study and uh, finish with a couple of words on uh, history and management. I also have to say that the paper was published a couple of days ago, so if you're interested, I can, you can contact me later. I'll give you my details and send the paper. Um, so in the 1960s and 70s, when the first time man-made um, objects, uh, persistent and solid, were, um, um, were recognized as envir uh, environmental threat in the marine environment, um, the most common um, term was marine debris or marine litter, which is uh, basically any man-made mat material that enters the, uh, the, marine ocean, uh, the marine environment from any source. However, over time, uh, since plastic component of marine debris has increased drastically to 80 to 90 percent, and plastic is also the most, um, the most harmful component of marine debris, we gradually narrow down to plastic debris or plastic pollution. So what are the main sources? They can be divided into land-based sources and uh, marine-based debris, uh, marine -based sources. And we estimated that 80% of uh, debris globally uh, comes from land-based sources, such as littering, beach, beach and street littering, um, various industries, uh, improper waste management, uh, discharge, um, uh, stormwater discharges, and other intentionally or unintentionally released uh, litter as well as natural disasters, while the marine-based are related to shipping, fishing, and offshore drilling, and as well, natural disasters. Uh, the most common impacts of plastic, uh, plastic pollution are plastic ingestion and entanglement. Uh, uh, the uh, plastic ingestion causes physical impacts, such as blockage or rupture of the digestive system which blockage can uh, further lead to false sense of satiation and starvation and finally death. We know that there are many sea, uh, seabird and marine turtle species um, that are heavily affected by, this, uh, by plastic ingestion. However, more recently, um, uh, concerns have been raised about microplastics, which are tiny plastics, uh, tiny pa uh, plastic particles uh, smaller than five or one millimeter, depending on authors, or different authors, and they can be primary or, or secondary. Primary microplastics are the ones that are produced to be so small, um, such as plastic abrasives used for polishing, or you know mi about microbeads which are used in um, uh, cosmetics, and plastic noodles, which are basically raw material for producing other plastic products. And secondary uh, microplastics are the ones that are. Um, uh, mechanically, body, uh, mechanically degraded from larger objects into smaller particles, and there is a, a variety of um, ways that they form, so I'm not going to go deep into that. Um, there is another concern when it comes to plastic ingestion, um, which is um, chemical. We, uh, uh, during manufacturing of plastics, um, there are chemicals added into the structure of plastics, which can leach out, or um, when the plastics um, when the plastics spend time in the ocean, they can uh, uh, attach they can attach um, uh, uh, chemicals that are already present in the ocean onto their surfaces. So when the animal eats a piece of plastic, the the chemicals detach from the surface or leach out of the plastic into the animal tissue and uh, accumulate there. These chemicals are also called persistent organic pollutants or um, endocrine disruptors, which means that they affect the, the hormonal system of an animal. So the main reason why I chose the topic is because in the, in the South Pacific region, at the time when I was starting, there was very little information on uh, plastic ingestion by fish, which are also in the Pacific Islands very important food, food source. So now a couple of words about the study. The main objectives of the study uh, were to perform a broad scale assessment of plastic ingestion across um, multiple species which are commonly consumed in the Pacific Islands, then to develop a cheap and easily replicable 
analytical methods um, to investigate whether there is a, a trophic transfer of plastics from prey to predator and as well uh, to look at the differences between in plastic ingestion across different locations in the throughout the Pacific as well as um, to study to, to see if there are any patterns in plastic ingestion across different habitats uh, trophic levels and trophic guilds and finally to um, determine the sizes and types color opacity and polymer type of the plastics that were found in the fish so uh, the samples were collected uh, during the uh, 2015 and 16 and um, from four locations, Auckland, Samoa, Tahiti and Rapa Nui. And of course, uh, you can guess, my favorite one was Tahiti. <laughs> and this is what I looked like the whole time. I was just super happy. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. This is me on the boat uh, um, collecting samples with fishermen and um, loving it, absolutely. So. Uh, we collected 34 species altogether for the for, from the four locations with the sample size 10 or less than uh, or over 10 of uh, fish per species from different uh, habitats and different uh, trophic guilds. Uh, the analytical method included uh, several steps. Um, basically, it was scraping out the gut content um, and uh, um, checking f visually for uh, uh, for larger plastic particles, then the gut content was added into 15% uh, hydrogen peroxide to, to allow um, the organic pa uh, portion to dissolve. And then the liquid with the remaining undissolved residue was filtered, vacuum filtered on a set of three, on a set of, th on a set of three filters, you'll see here, to allow um, the separation, size separation of the particles, which makes the microscopic analysis easier. So the, the, the filters were then later examined under the microscope and the extracted particles were further uh, um, chemically analyzed to see the, what the polymer types were. Um, so we found that 33 out of 34 species contained plastic. Only one species from New Zealand didn't, garfish didn't eat plastic. Um, out of a total of 932 spe specimen across all species, uh, 226 contained plastic, which means almost a quarter of all the examined fish, um, with a plastic load of 2.4 particles per, per fish. We also confirmed that um, secondary ingestion or trophic transfer of plastics from pre uh, to predator exists and actually occurs truly in the, envi in the environment because this was only uh, prior to this study um, uh, um, shown experimentally, demonstrated experimentally that it happens in the in the lab, but it uh, but this is the first time that we show that it actually happens in the environment. So what we did was um, we had ten carnivorous species and um, all the prey that was not dissolved, that was not digested, we looked at their gut content and found plastic in 10 out of 57 uh, examined fish. The maximum ingestion rates were 70% uh, in uh, New Zealand parore and uh, yellowfin tuna from Easter Island. And uh, we also found what I still believe is the world record of uh, plastic ingestion by a single fish, which was 104 pieces of plastic in one Pacific chub from Easter Island. And more, most plastics were uh, microplastics smaller than five millimeters. Uh, we found something interesting, which we um, expected, but it was really cool to see that we actually got the results. So we looked at the differences in um, ingestion rates across the four locations, of which uh, Rapa Nui, Rapa Nui is situated. Rapa Nui is situated in the South Pacific uh, subtropical gyre, which is a known accumulation zone where the uh, currents tend to accumulate the drifting debris in general, including plastic. So, uh, in that area, the concentration of plastics is increased, and at the same time, that's the same area in which the uh, in which the, the concentration of uh, primary of chlorophyll, which indicates primary production, is also lowered. So in, it means that at the same time, these two factors come simultaneously to 
to um, cause increased significantly increased um, uh, plastic ingestion in the subtropical gyre area. We also found that benthopelagic fish, benthopelagic fish ingested in, uh, um, significantly more plastic than the fish that live in the pelagic zone or the benthic fish. However, we didn't find any difference between the fish uh, that um, live in the coastal zone as opposed to the fish that live offshore. Um, regarding the trophy gills, we found that benthic predators eat significantly less plastics than um, omnivores. However, I believe this was a bias because the omnivorous group contains only two species pulled together, of which one was from, Tahit from, from Tahiti and ingested a lot of plastic, 49% 40, of fish had plastic, while the benthic predators had very low um, plastic, showed a, a low plastic uh, um, ingestion because uh, when we tested when we tested our methods um, when we tested our methods um, we found that um, that the the gut content of benthic predators which contains very often shells and bones and scales and stuff like that which are under uh, uh, un non dissolvable uh, that makes it harder to find under the microscope so the, the, this type of gut content we found less plastics due to, because we could, we, we, it's harder to find. And it's not necessarily that they actually eat less. Um, then this is just a couple of photos to show you um, what the microplastics that I extracted look like. So this is in Parora in New Zealand. You can see that they're actually pretty big as well. Then Samoa and Tahiti, the uh, square tail mullet from Tahiti and Israel Island, and in the last row is the, the, f the one that I said that ingested 104 pieces of plastic, that's, that's the photo of all the plastics that I found in that one fish. Bad, huh? <laughs> okay, so how did it all start? The first plastic polymer, uh, true synthetic plastic polymer, was produced in 1907. However, the mass production started in uh, after the Second World War, and that's where basically the, pro the problems started. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's basically where the problem started. And as you can see here, the um, the production of plastics coincides with the production of w world production of oil, which is logical because plastics are made from fossil fuels. Um, however, that was still all fine until we started using plastic unsustainably. Um, and the main, uh, the, main, uh, the main component of plastic debris right now are single-use plastics, which we know is uh, cutlery, g cups and stuff like that. Bags, plastic bags, straws and all that. Here you can see from um, Life magazine 19, from 1955, they're actually promoting throwaway lifestyle. Um, in order to reduce time of washing dishes at home, so you just use uh, uh, disposable plastics and throw them away. That's how it all started back then. <laughs> uh, so, management. I know some people who would like to fix it this way, but it's illegal. Um, so, <laughs> so, unfortunately, since the, the the issue is so complex. The solution have to the, the, we have to um, apply integrated solutions, which include the following: uh, regulation, legislation, research, innovation, research, education, networking, capacity building, improved waste management, and all that with um, the focus on prevention. And finally, I would like to thank the following entities and humans related to them, especially the University of French Polynesia. I apologize for this. And <laughs> Nabila and Jean-Claude in particularly, and thank you so much for the collaboration. Thank you.